In this video, we're going to be talking about equivalent fractions, in other words, fractions that are equal to each other, and reducing fractions and how those two things are related. So the first thing we want to talk about is just this fraction here, 1 half. What this tells us is that there's two total parts and we have one of them. So you have one of two. And we can imagine that as a circle here. You can think about it as a pie. And you have half of the pie. You can see that you've divided it in half. You have half of it. Half of it's been eaten. And really it's just saying we've divided it into two pieces, this top piece and the bottom piece, and we only have one of them. So we have one of two. Now if instead of describing how much I have in halves, I want to instead describe how much pie I have in fourths, how would I go about doing that? Well, we could divide this other pie here, where we also have one half, into fourths instead of halves. So that would look like this. We divide it into four pieces instead of just two pieces. So here we've divided it into four pieces. How many do we have? Well, we count how many we have. One, two. So we have two of the four total pieces. So two fourths, two over four, is the same thing as one half. What if I want to describe how much pi I have in eights? In other words, how many eights are equal to one half? Well, I just need to take my pi and I need to divide it into eight total pieces. Right now it's in four pieces, one, two, three, four. I need to divide it into eight pieces. So if I say here eights like this, this is fourths, and then I want to divide these all in half again. So I want to do this and this, and now for my pi, I have eight total pieces, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight total pieces. How many make up one half? Well, I can count them, one, two, three, four. So four eighths make up one half. In other words, four eighths is the same thing as one half. So instead of having to draw this picture every time, how do we use math to figure out equivalent fractions? These three are all equivalent fractions here, but what if we want to find the equivalent fraction for tenths? So instead of dividing the pi into halves or fourths or eighths, we want to divide it into tenths and figure out how many tenths are equal to one half. Well, mathematically, the way that we do that is this. We say one half is going to be equal to some number over 10, right? Because we want tenths. So how many tenths are equal to 1 half? Well, here's what we do. We look at our denominators because we have both denominators. What do we have to multiply by 2 in order to get 10? Or in other words, what's 10 divided by 2? That's 5. So I have to multiply 2 by 5 in order to get to 10. 2 times 5 equals 10. So since I'm multiplying the denominator by 5, I also have to multiply the numerator by 5. Now I can say 1 times 5 equals 5, and I can say that the equivalent fraction in tenths to 1 half is 5 over 10. So 1 over 2 is equal to 5 over 10. So let's practice that, but with a different fraction. I'm starting here with the fraction 2 over 3. And instead of expressing it in thirds, I want to express it with the denominator of 6. So I want to say 2 thirds is equal to what over 6? Well, 3 times 2, I know, gives me 6. So that means I need to multiply by 2 over 2. When I multiply in the numerators, I'll get 2 times 2 is 4, of course my denominator is 3 times 2 gives me 6. So 4 over 6 is going to be equal to 2 over 3. What about with twelfths? Well, I'm going to say 2 over 3 times what is going to give me x over 12, basically. Well, I know 12 divided by 3 is 4, so I know I'm going to have to multiply the denominator by 4, which means I have to multiply the numerator by 4. 2 times 4 gives me 8, so 8 over 12 is going to be equal to 2 over 3. Even with a bigger number, like 21, right? I want to divide my pie into 21 pieces. What's going to be the equivalent to 2 thirds? Well, I do the same thing. I say 2 over 3 times what is going to give me something over 21. So I say 21 divided by 3, that gives me 7. I bring my 7 up here. I say 2 times 7 is 14. So I know that 14 over 21 is equal to 2 over 3. Now, in all of these examples, we've started with a completely reduced fraction, and we've gone up to other equivalent fractions that are not reduced. When you go the other way, when you start with a fraction like 2 over 4, 4 over 8, 5 over 10, and you're trying to get back to 1 half, we call that reducing fractions. And the way that we do that is we look for a common factor between the numerator and the denominator, and then we divide both the numerator and the denominator by that common factor. So for example, 2 over 4 here, is there anything that will go evenly into both 2 and 4? 
Well, in fact, 2 will go evenly into 2. Of course, 2 goes into itself. And 2 goes into 4 2 times. So I divide the numerator by 2, and I divide the denominator by 2. And what I get is 2 divided by 2 is equal to 1. 4 divided by 2 is equal to 2. See how I got back to 1 half here? I just reduced the fraction 2 fourths to 1 half. And 1 half is the fraction in lowest terms. It can't be reduced anymore because there's no common factor between 1 and 2 other than 1. Same thing here, if I want to try to reduce 4 over 8, I need to look for something that goes into both 4 and 8 evenly. And in fact, I can divide both the numerator and the denominator by 4. Of course, 4 goes into itself one time. 4 divided by 4 is 1. 8 divided by 4 is an even 2, so I get back to 1 half. Same thing here with 5 tenths. I could divide 5 and 10 by 5, and I would get back to 1 half. So that's called reducing fractions. We can do it with these examples too. So if we have 14 over 21 and we want to reduce it to lowest terms, we need to look for the greatest common factor between 14 and 21. Well, I know 14 and 21 are both divisible by 7, so I can divide 14 by 7 and I can divide 21 by 7. 14 divided by 7 is 2, 21 divided by 7 is 3. Notice that I get back to 2 thirds here. And there's no common factor between 2 and 3 other than 1, so I know that this fraction is in lowest terms. I know it's reduced as much as possible. Sometimes it might take you a couple tries to get a fraction in lowest terms. So let's look at, for example, the fraction 80 over 100. What if I look at both of these numbers and I say, well, these are both divisible by 2. If I divide 80 by 2, I get 40. If I divide 100 by 2, I get 50. Now I look at this fraction and I see that it's still reducible. They're both even numbers, so I, I know at least I can divide by 2 again. If I divide by 2 again, I get 20 over 25. Notice that just because I've taken a common factor out of both the numerator and the denominator doesn't mean that I've taken the greatest common factor out of both, which means that I haven't necessarily reduced the fraction to its lowest form. I'm sitting here at 20 over 25, and I realize that I can divide 5 into both 20 and 25. So if I say 20 divided by 5, I get 4. If I say 25 divided by 5, I get 5. And now I can see that I've reduced the fraction as much as possible because there's no common factor between 4 and 5 that'll go into both evenly other than 1. So this is my completely reduced fraction. This is the fraction in its lowest form. And because of this reduction process, I can say that 80 over 100 is an equivalent fraction to 40 over 50, which is an equivalent fraction to 20 over 25, which is an equivalent fraction to 4 over 5. All of these are equivalent fractions, but this one is in lowest terms. And if I wanted to bring this back around full circle to where we started, and I said that I was starting with 4 fifths, and I wanted to express 4 fifths in terms of hundredths, I would just say, what do I have to multiply this by to get hundredths, well, I would say I have to multiply 5 by 20 to get 100, so I bring the 20 up here, 4 times 20 gives me 80, and you can see I get back to 80 over 100. So that's how you deal with equivalent fractions and reducing fractions.